what title, you know, like, uh, you, you know, like vineyard manager, winery owner, what, what title do you want to be, uh, have bestowed on you? <laughs> Grape farmer. Grape farmer? Yeah. All right. Uh, that a lot of people call it a viticulturist, viticulturalist. I uh, I like grape farmer better. Yeah, <laughs> I guess in in France, you know, in French there is no it's word for for winemaker. It uh, I think it's um, it, it translates something like uh, wine uh, wine grower. In France, the the grower is called a vigneron. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't even yeah. think that they have a word for wine. Uh, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. I couldn't tell you. I know in France the the, uh, the I think the the growers get a little more of the uh, glory, I, I guess. <laughs> and, and you don't you don't feel like they do here? Uh, I, I I think vineyards get you know vineyards get names for themselves as you as you start consistently putting out good wine. Yeah. But um, there's a few growers that are known and. and it, and among the winemakers, I think they get lots of credit, a lot of respect. But I think the general public doesn't. Uh, uh, they, they they pretty much think it's all about the winemaker, for the most part. Huh. I think most winemakers would tell you that it's it's about the vineyard. Uh, yeah. And I've heard. Uh, I got. A ch- I was uh, introduced Michael Sebastiani to Peter Ross back, uh, and uh, they were. They were discussing. Uh, they were talking about how much, what percentage of effect does the winemaker have on the grapes when he makes wine? Yeah. They both pretty much agreed it was about fifteen to twenty percent. That high, huh? Well, I didn't think that was high enough. Oh, I think is that, that right? yeah, I think they have a little more effect than that. But that's what those guys thought. You know, I I I was thinking probably more like you know thirty or. Thirty percent, or something like that. Thirty-three yeah. percent. Yeah. Anyway, well, it's they're, just out, a, they're out tasting. You know, they're 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 out with the fruit and uh, you know, tasting and, and things. So, yeah, it's like I've heard a lot less than that. Have you? Some winemakers, yeah. I mean, we're yeah. talking five, ten percent. Uh huh. Just kind of uh, being the shepherd to not ruin what uh, you know what, what's coming. Well, I think that for great grapes, that's the that's the deal. But I've seen grapes that have come in that haven't been so great, you know. And I've seen Peter Rosbach make great wine out of it, make good wine out of it. Not maybe not great, but yeah. good wine out of it. How many, um, like in here in the, the Columbia or in the, the, the gorge here, it's like how many um, tons per acre are you aiming for? Uh, generally speaking, we get there's some ver- some varietals will, will be. But the old vine Zinfandel is about two, two ton an acre for the old vine Zinfandel. But uh, generally speaking, we're we're running about somewhere around three, three. about three ton an acre. Uh-huh. Yeah, three to three and a half. Yeah, uh-huh. it, it, it depends on the variety. Yeah, like Cabernet, I, I don't want to get up much more than three because it's a late, uh, it's a late uh, harvesting variety. It's it's the last one. And do you run into like the end of the season for those, or is that is yeah, it sometimes. comfortable here? No, it's we're right up we're up against the edge, yeah. And um, yeah, this year was a this year was a it was a little strange because uh, some varieties uh, that, that quite often I have you know I got a little bit of a problem with uh, some of those varieties came on really well, and, and other varieties that. That uh, you know, stuff just wasn't picking on its on its normal times this year. And some of it had to do with crop levels, and and uh, I don't I don't know. Like the Cabernet, was, uh, we had uh, we finished picking on the second of November, which wow. is pretty late for us. Wow. We, but we usually finish you know in the Cabernet and Zinfandel by you know late the last week of October. Uh, and how many varietals do you grow, you know, here in the, the Columbia Gorge? And what are they? <laughs> it's a litany. Well, it uh, certainly is. Yeah, it's a real litany. I, I don't even know what the count is. I can I can name them. I can name them uh, over in, uh, and some of them are grown over in the Hood River and uh, and 
in white salmon uh, areas, and some uh -huh. of them are grown here, and some of them are grown east of here, uh, down along the river, especially on the Washington side. Uh, but starting over by the Hood River and white salmon areas, uh, I would consider uh, those to be more Burgundian varieties, and uh, uh, d depending upon the elevation, um, uh, Al uh, some Alsace style uh, varieties. That would be Pinot Gris, Gewurz Demeanor. Um, the Pinot Noir, of course, uh, Burgundy, and there's Chardonnay over there, uh, Riesling. So those, those varieties are grown over there. Uh, as you come, um, as you come east, uh, you cross into Mosier and Rowena and, uh, and the Dallas area, and uh, most of the varieties that you see there are uh, um, more like uh, either Bordeaux or Rhone varieties. The Rhone varieties uh, probably in the, in the uh, Mosier and, and uh, Lyle area uh, on, on the Washington side of the river. And uh, you'll see Syrah. We've got Syrah, Grenache. Um, there is some Pinot Noir in, in some of those transition zones. Wow, really? Yeah. Uh, there's... Uh, you know, people. You know, it's still it's still young enough that people are kind of still figuring out what's going to work where and at what elevation. The elevations are all important too. I, there's there's I farm vineyards or at least I have farm vineyards in the same year that went from 1,800 foot to uh, about uh, 500 foot. I mean, not one vineyard, but right. But like over in the in the Hood River Valley, uh, I sited and planted the Y East Vineyard and, and the and the high end of the Y East Vineyard is eighteen hundred feet. And uh, what was that planted with? Pinot Noir, uh, huh. a due south slope. And then it also has Pinot Gris on it. Huh. The Pinot Gris is on a west slope that falls off to the west and it's also a little lower. And that uh, at eighteen hundred feet it's like you know like people always say like that, that Pinot likes like cooler evenings and, and right. like you get that um, Yeah, you do. Uh, Peter Rosbeck makes uh, he makes a Pinot Noir uh, vineyard designet off of Y East Vineyards, huh. um, and then Phelps Creek over in the in the Hood River Valley is a, uh, another good Pinot Noir site that Peter has used. Uh, they've now started up their own winery, uh, kind of like me. Uh -huh. They start out as, and I cited that vineyard originally for the Pinot Noir. It's about, I think it's around 1,100 feet, um, but. You know, like my, what people don't realize, there, there's a lot of hills and, 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 you know, lots up and down here around the Dalles, hills and canyons and that sort of thing. But the Dalles is uh, one of the lowest points in the Columbia Basin, right before it's, it goes up to cross the Cascades. And actually, downtown the Dalles, uh, the Columbia River is at 100 foot above sea level. Is that right? Yeah. Holy cow. So when you go out to my house, you're not really that high. Uh -huh. You just were up on the hill at, at, in my vineyard taking pictures, and so that felt other. like you were on top of the world. But you were really only about uh, the, the 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 top of that hill is at 600 feet. That's only 600 feet yeah. at, uh, where the old Zinn is. Yeah, the, the yeah. top of the hill. Six. It's uh, it's uh, 650. 650. What yeah. what um, what varietal is uh, that? That's kind of at the top of the hill. Like it would be kind of like to to the west of. Uh, you know, toward Mount Hood from the old Zen. Merlot. That's Merlot. Yeah. So yeah, when you get into Dallas and, and and come across the Mosier area, you're looking at uh, Merlot Vineyard, Syrah, and that's where I have the Zinfandel. That's where somebody planted old vine Zinfandel, and they did a great job siding it. Uh, yeah, and that was a good, when they sided that. That was a good uh, good choice there. Well, yeah, nobody thought so until we started making wine out of it, and it turned out that. Some excellent wine, yeah. um, and uh, so I made cuttings and, and expanded the vineyard. Uh, there's other blocks, but there's only one block of old vine Zinfandel. Uh, we have Cabernet in that in that canyon, uh, and then in some of the other areas, and uh, down on the valley, you know, these are up on benches. And down on the valley floor, it's a lot cooler. There's a there's a dramatic difference between what's in the valley floor and what's up on those benches uh, at, at my place. Uh -huh. um, uh, we have uh, Chardonnay 
over there. That was the first variety I planted there in 1983 in that, in so that valley. That's up at Terry McDuffie's, up at McDuffie Vineyards, just uh -huh. just up up the road about two miles from my vineyard. Okay. <coughs> and we even have some. And it's down in that little creek valley then. Well, it's uh, uh, it's actually on the left. If you're driving up the creek, up the valley, uh -huh. it's it's on a slope that is just below the road, just to the left of the road. Okay. You, you go past the you go past the Grange Hall, and it's. It's on a Down. yeah slope there. Okay. It's about 60 foot, you know, it's 60 foot uh, up off the creek bottom. Yeah. There's just enough slope though that it, that it keeps it out of harm's way on the frost from issues the and that sort of thing. Yeah. It faces south. And what uh, what kind of uh, grapes are those? Well, that's Chardonnay, Chardonnay. And, and then we we also have planted on farther up uh, Syrah and uh, Cabernet. Planted Cabernet there in '85. And uh, it's actually uh, been a really nice vineyard. Uh, huh. Again, uh, Shanaean used to make a vineyard designate out of it. Uh, he's moved on to a few other vineyards. He's buying some out in Napa Valley, and he's got a had an He's got uh, Paul Shampoo Cabernet, which is excellent Cabernet, and then he's got uh, uh, opportunity to buy some out of the uh, oh, what's it, the Cold, Cold, the Cold Creek. Uh, uh, vineyard uh, that Chateau Saint Michel owns, uh -huh. and that's one of the oldest uh, Cabernet blocks in uh, in the Northwest. So, so I'm going to start making uh, Cab out of that McDuffie oh, vine yeah? vineyard block. Yeah, um, and let's see. Um, You've got the whole gamut here. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. In in one tight little area. Yeah. Well, that's uh, so. If you if you continue farther east. I mean, we're actually growing uh, Riesling up on uh, here in the Dalles on some uh, uh, hills that are up a little higher, uh, eight eight hundred feet. Uh, we got Riesling, and uh, what else do we have? Uh, we got Pinot Noir on some off slopes. Uh, I don't know that. Uh, I'm not going to argue with uh, some of the other people about whether we're world class Pinot Noir, but we we ripen it every year, and and uh, we have a lot of people buy it. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're they're pleased with it, but the um, kind of the the varieties that I think do the best around here, I would say, would be the Syrah, the Merlot, and the Zinfandel. That's that's kind of my hit on it. Uh, the Chardonnay does a nice job. Uh, that's uh, in Mill Creek Valley. That's more like a California style Chardonnay. Uh, we get we get it real ripe every year. It's like the first first vineyard that I pick almost every year. Um, I sell it to uh, uh, Pheasant Valley Cathedral Ridge and uh, also Mary Hill. Mary Hill puts it in there. That's their reserve Chardonnay. Uh, so, but as we go farther east, um, let's see. I'm, I'm trying a Viognier block, uh, which is a Rhone white. So now where is that? And that's uh, that's over on Three Mile. That's the next valley over. Uh, to the east from On my place, side. yeah, from my place, uh -huh. yeah, and uh, and it's some of those same varietals. We've got uh, Cabernet and uh, uh, Merlot, uh, pretty fair amount of Merlot, and some Zinfandel over on Three Mile, uh -huh. um, and then you go east from there uh, about another ten miles uh, and get right on the banks of the of the Columbia on the Washington side. Um, where the, the the vineyards are right down next to the to the water and uh, uh, is that like the, in Goldendale and that area? No, no, not that far. Huh. Dallasport, Dallasport, right huh. across the river. You go right across the river and then turn east on Highway 14. Uh -huh. You go to Maryhill. Yeah. Okay. Well, Maryhill's 15 miles down there, but you know where Cascade Cliffs is? You know, I guess I don't. No. Well, Cascade Cliffs is about six or seven miles uh, to the east, so it's just off Highway down. 14. Yeah, huh. and they have Barbera. Uh, what else do they have? They have Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, there's, uh, and then if you go on down to Mary Hill, they're growing. Uh, they've got Zinfandel uh, cuttings they got from from me off the old vines in years ago. Uh, 
they have Syrah, they've got uh, Barbera. Um, what's some of those other Italian varieties? Um, Sangiovese. Uh, no, and there's some Grenache. We, uh, we, we have some Grenache around here as well. Yeah. So huh. it's quite a it's, it's quite a gamut in, in, a, in a really short space of 40 miles. So it's 40 miles like you're, you're considering? 40 miles from, uh, from the, uh, the west side of the Hood River Valley to Mary Hill. Uh-huh. In that four, yeah. you, you have all those varieties in 40 miles. And it doesn't go very far out. No. Yeah. Is, huh. What about like the, the soil? Well, a lot of the soil around here is, uh, uh, there's a lot of different classes as far as the soils go, but uh, I think that the best thing that I could say is that, uh, you know, you find that most of the vineyards are on well-drained soil. Uh, to me, that's, that, that's, that's the important part, just make sure it's well-drained. Uh, you know, there's soil left over from the glacial floods. The huge floods that came through here, yeah, and uh, some of that's uh, blow sand, blow sand. It's less. Uh, you have um, silt loam soils. Uh, most of my soil is out. Oh, thanks, man. All right, bye bye. Put the wine in the in the shop. Okay, I will. Um, we've got. Um, then as you go out these canyons, out where I'm at, uh, you're almost at a at a point where the glacial floods uh, stopped, and you and, and the soil there is uh, coming from uh, volcanic action that uh, happened years ago, the predecessor of Mount Hood, because Mount Hood sits at the uh, top of Mount Valley. Hood, or from the um, the eastern uh, Oregon, like the big glacial or not glacial, but uh, big uh, lava flows that. Uh, that came away from the east, eastern Oregon. Well, I, I have a uh, friend that's uh, a geology professor, and he says it's from predecessors of Mount Hood. Okay. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what the names of the predecessors were. Yeah. Uh, and they had uh, some of that same thing over in the Hood River and White Salmon Valleys, uh, meeting up with uh, soils that you know were brought down from by, by the glacial flooding. Um, how high did that stuff, how, how, uh, that glacial flooding, how high did that go? Like, how high do you see those, that kind of soil? Well, I guess how you measure how high it was is, is where you see uh, granite deposited because granite is, doesn't yeah. come from around here. Yeah. And it comes from Montana. We have granite boulders. Uh, up on top of the old Vines Inn vineyard. Uh, so not only is it, it's about uh, probably four and a half or five miles from the river, it's it's up that high as well. And my neighbor has granite boulders up at his place and I think he's higher than me. He's probably 800 feet. The, uh, the floods, uh, I think, I think, generally speaking, we're around a thousand foot. The water when it came through here was about a thousand foot about high. Thousand foot. Yeah, because of the narrow walls, uh, the water spread all over the place uh, and went into the Walula, went down there and pooled behind the Walula Gap, and then it came down the from the Walula Gap, and when it got to about. Uh, Oh, probably right around where the John Day Dam is, or the John Day River. About the John Day, probably around the John Day Dam, the walls of this uh, uh, of the gorge get higher, and it gets a lot narrower, uh -huh. and so the okay? water got forced higher. Thanks. Um, I'll have one more. Okay. So. Um, I don't put as much emphasis on uh, the type of soil as uh, I know in Willamette Valley there w there's a lot of interest in differences between Jory soils and Willakinsey soils and oh, things like that guy. and uh, I just don't put as much emphasis into that maybe you know, I mean 
the French have been doing this for a thousand years, and we've been doing it for about. I've been doing it for 30 years, uh -huh. so you know, <laughs> I'm kind of an old timer at it around here. Uh -huh. But uh, there's, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to learn. I, I, I'm going to probably leave the differences in all these souls up to uh, whoever comes after me, or, or maybe two after me. Right now, I'm just trying to figure out, um, you know, what varieties work best in what places um, and when you're you're citing a vineyard uh, it's like what what's your thought process like what are you thinking about you go out and you look at the land and and so what, what, what are your thought processes you know it's like what's on the top of the list what, what, what are the next things that you think about well around here what I want to know is is I want to know uh, how much heat is there I want to know how much heat that, that place accumulates. Uh -huh. And it, there's some um, huge differences, uh, and you wouldn't think they were so different. Differences because <coughs> of, of, of like valley <coughs> orientations or height or? Well, uh, slope orientations. Uh -huh. uh, slope orientations are very important. Whether it's east or west or south? Yeah. Uh, south is usually the very best. And then uh, that gets most of the warmth. Then yeah, and then well, and, and also how steep is it? To me, it's more important how steep it is than what kind of soil it is. Huh, what what? And 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 now don't get me wrong. I, I want to be sure and say the soil has to be well drained soil. It has to be able to you know water dr drains easily. That you can't have soil that water will pool up in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, having said that. That's really what I'm interested in as well. Is just that's as far as I go with the soil. Uh, now somebody else might take it to another level, but I'm not there. Uh, but what I'm interested in is is how steep is it? Can we farm it without having to terrace it? The reason I like steep slopes, especially south facing slopes, is because your ripening time for grapes. It was usually uh, the end of August, all of September, and the f first half of o first week or two of October. Okay, so basically, the ripening time is September, with a little bit on either, uh, you know, a little bit in front of it, a little bit behind it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, the sun is getting a lot lower in the sky in September, so when the sun's low in the sky and you had a steep slope here at this northern latitude, you had a lot more direct heat. On your on your uh, vineyard, it, it, it's like a big catcher's mitt. The, you know, it, it's the, more perpendicular. Exactly. Being perpendicular exactly. To, uh, yeah. So it captures the heat better. Yeah. And to me, that's what I'm looking for. I'm 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 at a pretty some of the varieties that I'm growing. There's people that swear you can't grow Zinfandel this far north, uh -huh. but I'm on a 26 percent slope that's terraced, huh. and it faces. Uh, almost due south and um, that, that's a big factor uh, where it faces that same vineyard there's a there's a slope that falls off to the east and where it falls off the east we pick that two weeks later huh. and uh, and then we so where it falls off to the west on the southwest slope if you have a variety that's uh, thin skinned out there like Zinfandel is uh, you really got to protect it from sunburn in August. Uh, that's another. It's, those are all the kinds of factors that I'm looking at. Um, I'm trying. I, I know when different varieties pick, at what time of the year they pick. So uh, when are they going to come on? Uh, we've started putting probes out around the area and different. I mean, we've got. I've got. Ten probes out in in a five mile radius just to just to be plugging into what's going on in the microclimate. T temperature probes. Yes, uh -huh. and they they track the temperature every actually every fifteen minutes they tell you the temperature and then you can you can get heat unit readings for the year uh -huh. for the growing season and uh, so I use the old vines in as a base and these are battery powered and we put them out in in. Uh, March and then we pick them up uh, now. It's time to pick them up now, and so I put those out and then we can download and see what uh, how many heat units we had and then I can compare 
you know, I use uh, like the old vines in uh, as kind of a base. My, that's my control. And then I can see where I'm at on in other blocks. Am, am I less heat units or am I more heat units or am I about the same? Yeah. And that kind of gives me some indications as to you know what varieties will grow in the, these places. And then we, and then you you got off slopes. Uh, off slope. What's an off slope? Like a north slope. Okay. Or or an east northeast slope or something like that. What, yeah. What's going to grow there? Well, it. It, it probably not going to be the ones that have to have the most heat and, t- and are later in your picking order. You might, and I try not to plant those to tell you the truth. But um, you know, sometimes if a guy, you know, has got like I've got a vineyard over in Three Mile that I do, and we've got thirty acres of uh, a vineyard, and we've got uh, his his particular land is uh, probably. Uh, I would guess uh, 25 acres is uh, facing south or south uh, southeast, south or southeast. But there's five acres at the top where it falls over toward the northeast. Uh-huh. So what are you gonna do with that five acres? Yeah. yeah. Right. <clears throat> and so you know we you know, we plant a different variety on. Uh, on that block, you know, one that ripens earlier, that comes off uh, earlier, and and, and uh, is way earlier than what. Uh, so it, it comes off. Uh, you know, if it was on that southeast slope, it'd probably come off uh, mid September. But uh, on a northeast slope, it comes off first October. And 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 then the and then the stuff that ripens a little later, like the Merlot. Uh, on the, in that particular area, it, it, Merlot will come off around the 10th of October. And Zinfandel will come off around the 20th or 25th of October. Uh, oh, that much later on that. Yeah, day. and Cabernet will come off of, like the 30th, 28th or 30th. That's one of my later uh, cab blocks. This year, the cab crossed me up. The cab came off earlier than the Zinfandel did. Huh. So, uh, yeah, I still don't know exactly what happened there. But that's, <clears throat> so that's one valley over from where my vineyard is, where you, you've been out to my house, where my vineyard is. As a crow flies, this is four miles to the east. This, this, there's, there's Mill Creek Valley, which is where my vineyard is. You go over the ridge, and as a crow flies, it's four miles to three mile, three mile valley. Uh-huh. And, uh, and this is a hillside vineyard that I'm talking about. And the hillside vineyard, I, I, in, 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 in 1984, uh, 1983, Terry McDuffie hired me to uh, plant vineyard at his place and, and manage it. And I'm still working with him. Uh-huh. In 1984, Harold Hakey hired me for the same purposes. Um, so I planted the same thing in both places, basically. Uh-huh. Well, how was I to know there was going to be a big difference? Well, it turned out we planted Chardonnay in both places. Both Chardonnays are very nice Chardonnays, but one of them is one week behind the other when we pick it, just consistently down the line. Huh. Planted Cab in both places, planted Zinfandel in both places, consistently down the line. Three Mile Valley is one week later than Mill Creek. It's four miles away. It's just you just go over this ridge and it's it's in the next valley over. Yeah. Huh. And everything's one week later. It's a southeast slope uh, versus it's a south southeast slope versus a south slope it's it's not that big of a difference the only thing I can think of is that uh, what makes those two valleys so different is that the three mile valley is a very wide valley that's got a lot of green in it it's got a lot of green in it it's got a lot of uh, there's a lot of cherry trees over there there's cherry trees and there's cover crop under the cherry trees there's a lot of green <laughs> so you're thinking that that absorbs uh, yeah, some I think the there's some of that heat is absorbed. Off of it. Right, and the Mill Creek Valley is a very narrow valley, and it has uh, it has rocks uh, sticking out. It's got rock ledges, uh, a lot of uh, weathered uh, uh, faces uh, uh-huh. up higher in the valley. Where I think the rock absorbs some of the heat. I think since it's narrow, it's uh, uh, stays. The the heat is. Uh, Stays in that valley a little bit better, uh, and it's a it, it's a it's a very 
uh, striated going from the valley floor up to the bench. Uh, the 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 the, uh, the air gets um, what's the what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it kind of stacks up on itself. That at the at the valley floor, it's about eight degrees cooler than it is up on a bench. You only talk about a hundred foot difference elevation. Wow. And I mean, there's many times uh, we live on the valley floor. There's many times that I. That's one of the things I like about the place. Uh, uh, yeah, it's cool down there, and I get on a four wheeler and ride up to change irrigation in the evening, like at eight o'clock in the evening or nine, and. You know, the sun's dropped below the rim rock, you know, the ridge. And, uh, I mean, I've read it. It's 8 or 10 degrees warmer up on that bench. It's just that different. It's it's uh, it's, it's a strata. It's a... Uh, uh, I'm saying striated. Uh, it's... Uh, I can't think of the word I'm trying to look... I'm trying to find, but... It's 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 a big difference between the valley floor and the bench. It's only a hundred foot yeah. elevation difference oh, between that cool those two. Drops down. Yes, it does, and yeah. it and it's such a narrow valley that it it's, it stays there. Yeah. It's, it, and that makes sense. I mean, it's yeah. kind of trapped in there. Yeah, uh, in there. That old sin. How, how old are Stratified. Those roots? That's what Stratified. I'm trying to think of. Yes. Uh, the uh, the old sin. Like, how old are those roots? Well, I. I don't know for sure, but we have pictures of the vineyard that was taken in 1911. I'm, I'm assuming that it was planted right around the, the turn of the century, late 1800s, uh, you know, 1890s, 1900, right in there. Um, we, ha- we have uh, f- figured out who planted it. Um, his name uh, was Louis Comini, C-O-M-I-N-I. And he was Italian. It's quite a story. Um, Louis Comini uh, came over from Italy, uh, traveled across the United States, he, he, uh, the United States from Baltimore. He, he was a merchant seaman, and he jumped ship, tra- uh, wow. traveled from Baltimore to San Francisco. Uh-huh. <clears throat> While he was in San Francisco, he heard that uh, there was a a number of Italian stonemasons that were being put to work on a project up here in the northwest, up in Oregon, and he was a stonemason by trade. He, he, he went to work on this ship, probably just to get to the New World, I uh-huh. imagine. Uh, and that was in... Uh, I'm not sure when he jumped ship, but the... The project that was going on was building the Cascade Locks, wow. which is what the town of Cascade Locks is named after. Uh-huh. But Cascade Locks <coughs> was a series of locks that got around the uh, some rapids in the Columbia River. That <coughs> originally the Columbia the storm rulers could go from Portland to Cascade Locks. They'd have to portage, take all their all their freight, all their passengers, all their gear off. Put it on a, on a railroad. They go. They go up to, uh, to the above the rapids. Put it on another boat. That boat would bring it up to the Dalles. They would stop at the Dalles. They would portage around Slido Falls. Put it on a uh, railroad. Take it up above Slido Falls, and then go on up to the upper river. Probably all the way up to Tri Cities. Uh-huh. Um, well, Cascade Locks. When that was built, they built a locks around that rapids so that boats could. Could go straight all, all the way up to the Dallas. Yeah. And then the next locks that was built on the river. So, so, Comini, so Comini, Comini, they brought in 50 Italian stonemasons to do a lot of the work on this Cascade Locks. And, and, and Comini heard about that and came up and was working in that group uh-huh. coming up out of San Francisco. Now, that's a question. I don't know if he brought cuttings up out of the Bay Area or if he sent back home for them. I, I don't know. Yeah. But ultimately, what happened was that uh, the the uh, priest from the Catholic Church here in the Dalles d- wrote a circuit, and he'd go down to Cascade Locks, and he'd do masses down there for these Italians. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he offered a job to Louis Comini to come to the Dalles and and do the 
cemetery stones. Oh wow! Because they had a, it was a Catholic church with a Catholic cemetery, and they had a Protestant uh, stone mason. <laughs> so they wanted a Catholic stone mason, and so they offered a job to Komini, and Komini came, and that's what he did. He moved to the Dallas to do that. Now it just so happened that the guy that owned what is now the Pines, the guy that owned what is now the Pines, was a brother of the, of the priest, of the Catholic oh, priest. Okay. <coughs> and their name is uh, was Mespli. What was it, Mes? Mespli, M-E-S-P-L-I-E. And the priest's name was Toussaint Mespli, and he was French. He came over from France. And he, and he, uh, he was at Fort Vancouver when the, uh, when the soldiers uh, were after the after the Whitman massacre. The soldiers were sent from Fort Vancouver, at, to establish Fort Dalles, to help protect people that were just now were just starting to come out on the Oregon Trail, and they, and they were afraid that they, were, that, you know, with the Indians on the warpath, that they might not come. So, after the Whitman massacre, well, Toussaint Mespi came with them. Started a church over here, and uh, and he wrote his two brothers, who were down in the gold fields of California, and and, and said, you know, forget panning for gold. They're giving land away up here in Oregon. You ought to come up. Uh-huh. And so one of his brothers came up and settled over at uh, uh, Sh- What's that state park that's over there by the Aurora Donald exit, just halfway between there and Newburgh? Shampoo? Yeah, settled over by Shampoo State Park, uh-huh. and the other one settled my property, which uh, was, you know, just outside of the Dallas, uh-huh. and outside of Fort Dallas at that time. Yeah, and that yeah. was in uh, well, there's water rights from 1851 off of the creek, huh. and I was gonna. Uh, what I named the what I named our wine uh, the Pines 1852. I was going to name it the Pines 1851, and one of my friends says, "Well, what are you going to call your wine?" I said, "The Pines 1851." He says, "Oh, the Pines 151, huh?" <laughs> 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 and so I took a little poetic license, Eight, but the <laughs> the, the uh, that was one of the first properties carved out of the Northwest Territory uh, here in the Dalles. How and, cool is that? Yeah. Wow. So, 1852 was when the donation land claim was applied for, and that's what the 1852 means on, <laughs> on the label. And the Pines was uh, was a, a dairy. It was an incorporated dairy. Uh, the Pines Dairy was there from like 19, uh, 1920, the early 1920s through 1941 that was the Pines Dairy it's been known as the, that farm's been known as the Pines ever since that's why well, what's that big building that you know like that uh, that, uh, that has a big tall tower and, and stuff yeah it's a, it was a, a, a feed silo that was attached to a barn there was a there was a fire that took the barn out uh-huh. but the uh, feed silo the feed silos are still there yeah and then there's a milk house what we, where we store the wine is the milk house and there's you know a shop and a couple other you know there's it's all built in that Swiss uh, Swiss style with the hip roofs, uh-huh. and the reason for that is because uh, they brought a, a, a Swiss dairy man uh-huh. over from Switzerland, uh-huh. and he built he he and obviously some other people, but but he in particular was the uh, the push to get those all those buildings built. Yeah, that was in 1926. So cool. wow. so I'm going back to Louis Comini. Uh-huh. So Comini moves to the Dalles, and according according to his uh, well, here's the part I got that's that's crazy. This is part of the story that's crazy. Uh, Louis Comini outlived three wives. Wow. And when Louis was 65 years old, he had twin sons. His, his third wife had twin sons. Uh-huh. And that was in 1930. Louis lived to be 95 years old. Wow. And, I, and, and, and one of his twin sons came to see me two years ago. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. And he remembers picking grapes up on that hill 
when he was in elementary school. Him, him and his twin brother. Wow. His twin brother had just died about uh, a couple years before that, so about four years ago. Um, wow. But it turns out, I didn't realize, you know, I had moved here, and I, the Kalinis are a pretty well-known name here, but I didn't put it together. I, I had a, I had an old uh, uh, retired uh, uh, fire chief that, that belonged to the country club where I played golf uh, started telling me about him and uh, Jim, and Jim and Ted Camini breaking into old Louis Camini's uh, wine cellar and <laughs> drinking wine when they, were, when they were in high school and junior high school and and I got to thinking about that and, and uh, that started making a lot of sense and I, I mentioned it in a magazine article and the Camini family saw that that uh, article and then they came to me with all kinds of information about that vineyard wow yeah and so his son uh, Ted had uh, he came and uh, talked to me about this and said he remembered him and his brother and and his father they went out and picked grapes out there on the pines uh, at the pines dairy and they'd take the grapes down the hill and they crush them right down there next to the dairy farms uh-huh. ne- dairy barns uh-huh. Uh-huh. so um, and so like if now what remains of the old vine it's just like the roots are the original right and, right. and then like they froze back or uh, yeah it's, it, it's they're on their original roots there's no grafting and yeah the, everything above ground has frozen back twice that I know of uh-huh. but in the old days they didn't put those grape plants up on wires the way that you farm grapes around here in the old days you left them at ground level and you head train them and you head prune them and you prune them right down to the ground level and then uh, well, it's not a bush but it's lower than a bush then. well it's like a bush okay. it's like a bush okay. yeah right at ground level yeah the, the problem with that for modern day winemaking is that there's going to be too much dew, too much fungus, too much bunch rot, too much mildew. You can't get the shade. Yeah, you can't get sprays in there because it's right down there on the ground. Yeah. So I had to bring it up on a trellis, up on a wire, to get it up far enough so that you, the, the wind that we have here would be blowing through there and help keep that keep that dried out so we don't have fungal issues in there and we and we fight that a lot Zinfandel's uh, well known for bunch rot and that's uh, that's probably the biggest thing that we fight yeah. yeah how much rain like in the Dallas like how much rain do you get well if you start in Hood River you get about you'll see why I go to Hood River here you get about 30 inches of rain a year in Hood 30 River 30 inches at Hood River yeah. much yeah wow. yeah it's not a lot but it, it, uh, I'm not sure what. I think, what's pulling on about 42. 50? Okay, pulling is 42. Okay, but then so, there's some areas in the gorge that get way, way. Oh no, you got 100 inches yeah. of Cascade Locks. Yeah. That's right where the where the the, the kind of like the divide is between the west and east side of yeah. the Cascades. But at Hood River, you get 30 inches, and as you come east from Hood River, it, you get it drops an inch per mile. And it really holds wow. true. It really holds true. So what's that, like about 19 miles? Or, I yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and and you see the valley that I'm in actually goes west-southwest, so I'm back toward Hood River some. So I'm only about 13 miles from Hood River proper, or at least the valley, Hood River Valley. Wow. Um, so at, at my place, we get 17 inches of rain a year. Uh-huh. And you go that four, the four miles as the crow flies over to that other vineyard that I'm talking about in a three mile valley, the next valley over to the east, yeah. they get 13 inches of rain a year. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and you go, over, you go on over to the east side of the Dalles, and uh, you get down to about uh, 10 inches of rain a year, another three or four miles. And then it, then it starts tapering a little slower from there. Yeah. But it'll get down to about seven inches of uh, rain a year, you know, another 20 miles out past Mary Hill. And then it kind of holds true from there. Lonnie, what, uh, you know, what was it, a, you know, what attracted you to, you know, to the vineyard? What was it that uh, that attracted you to the vineyard? 
to the Pines Vineyard? To the no, no, high no. place? Um, yeah, it was like, oh. As a career. As a, oh, being in, in a vineyard yeah, business. Like maybe just give me a little short history. Uh, well, uh, two minutes? Yeah, two minute history. Uh, you, ever, you ever want me to talk on something for two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. Uh, yeah. Well, I was I was working on a big uh, pivot farm in Eastern Washington, uh-huh. and uh, uh, and it was like a, a grain, like like wheat or something like that. You know, potatoes, potatoes, okay. grain, corn, and uh, I was doing irrigation work there. And Chateau Saint Michel bought the farm, and that is, that farm is now where Columbia Crest is. And, and so they, they got about, I don't know, four, I don't know, maybe four or five of us to be foremen, and there, was, there were a number of other people that, you know, helped to put that in, but we planted 2,000 acres of grapes in about three years. Jeez, yeah. holy cow. And uh, that was where Paul Shampoo uh, got his start, and uh, Wade Wolf was brought up, and and uh, uh, he's a PhD, and uh, he he uh, actually was the head of uh, vineyards for Chateau Saint Michel, and uh, taught us, you know, how to how to take care of grapes, and uh, and I enjoyed it. I I enjoyed the the work, but I also kind of looked at it and said, Man, this is a cutting edge. This is a real opportunity if a guy's really paying attention this is an opportunity to get on the cutting edge of something that is going to transform this thing because there's some pretty smart people here who have invested a pretty large amount of money in this project and I have a lot of respect for Wade Wolf I still do what, what year was that? that was in uh, about 78 yeah and um uh, and it just looked to me like the, the, this was a chance to be on the front end of, uh, you know, front end of the cutting edge. Yeah. Uh, it turned out that about that time I um, I met a girl from Hood River, and uh, and we got married, and I couldn't see her coming out to the the desert of eastern Washington and moving out of Hood River, one of the most beautiful. One of the most beautiful places on earth, you know. And uh, I'm not sure what about me impressed her, but it certainly wasn't where I lived. <laughs> uh, so I promised her before we got married that if she would move out there for a year, so I'd kind of finish my my quotation marks apprenticeship. Uh-huh. That would be my third year out there. But if she moved out there for a year, then I I moved to the back to the Columbia Gorge with her. Yeah. And 30 days before that year was up, she was take, bringing me down to Hood River and showing me a house that she wanted me to put the <laughs> first and last month's rent down on. Yeah. I mean, it was like years up. Yeah. Yeah. Years up. Um, right before I started working with Columbia Crest, I I had uh, had the opportunity to go overseas and work in Northern Africa in Libya. We put a pivot irrigation farm in the Sahara Desert, and one of the guys that I met uh, was going back. Uh, this was uh, three years after that first trip. He was going back another time with a smaller outfit. Uh, they had a, a contract to fix a bunch of pivots in another part of Libya, and it just so happened that uh, he came by the farm as like couple, three months before I was getting ready to get, get my resignation and asked if I wanted to go over there. So I went back over there with him again, uh, with his crew, and uh, worked over there. And that gave me kind of a, a way to build a stack and, 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 and make that transition without having a job set in Hood River, the Dallas area. And then when I got over here, um, I actually... Uh, I was drawing on employment, and I kind of looked around and see what was going on around here, and, and uh, decided, well, I'm going to I'm going to start a vineyard management company, and 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 I went out. Well, we 
first thing that happened is that we moved to Hood River. And uh, we had about a three month old uh, child. And that was your, your first son. Or my son, yeah. And then I went to Libya and worked in Libya. Oh, nice. For about three, a little over three months. Uh-huh. It was a construction deal. And, uh, well, when I got back, the next move I made was I went over to uh, Un- Underwood Mountain uh, to uh, Salilo Vineyard. Uh-huh. Rick Insmeyer was mm-hmm. managing Salilo. And I made a deal with Rick and I said, I'll. I'll prune for you for a week if I can have all the prunings that I cut off. I'll prune for free for a week. I says, okay, why would he say no? And so then I went over with my 62 GMC pickup, and 16 loads later, I had huge piles. <laughs> I had 16 truckloads of pruning <laughs> sitting in my front yard. <laughs> Luckily, we were out in the country, but they were sitting in my front yard, and I sat on a on a porch there for the next two months and made 15,000 cuttings. Holy and bundle them in bundles of 100 and put them in sawdust. And and, uh, and then I planted uh, the 15,000 cuttings uh, that spring in a friend's little barnyard. And, and that's, how I got, that's how I got into the vineyard business. Then uh, somebody, uh, the word got out that I had them and... and uh, I had a couple guys give me a call and ask if I wanted to, the Chardonnay that's out at Tilly McDuffie's on Mill Creek is, 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 that is right? from that stock, yeah. Huh. yeah. How cool, what a great story, what a great story. <laughs> what, um, you know, what has the vineyard like taught you about life? You know, what kind of lessons have you learned from the vineyard about life? Well, I think you really have to have a passion for what you do. Uh, I think life's a lot more fun when you really enjoy, you know, going out there every day and just doing what you do. Uh, that's to me. That's one of the big lessons: is enjoy what you do. Enjoy what you do. My son uh, is working with us. He's twenty. He just turned twenty-seven in uh, September. He's He's one of these guys that's very, very talented at everything he does. Everything. He's really talented. Yeah. Uh, he's a self-taught computer expert, genius, guru, whatever you want to call it. But that doesn't... That doesn't he doesn't enjoy that as much. Uh-huh. You know, he, he, he can fix any computer. He had a computer business. He was making 40 bucks an hour you know, when he was in high school fixing people's computers. Yeah. They just didn't really like it. You know, it, was just, it just didn't give him that, what he needed. Now he's doing construction. He's helping me build a house. Um, he's getting to the point where he can build about anything. He's turned into a craftsman. He just really, really likes it. it he's like got great attitude every day. So, th- you know, that's the thing that's given him his, his shot of happiness yeah. uh, is con- building something for me it's you know I, I go out in the vineyard and see the grapes coming to fruition and uh, you know just trying to get better at it every year you know try to keep keep being or at least keep being good at it uh, tr- and, the, and the wine in a bottle is the ultimate uh, you know that's the ultimate uh, test um, I think that's important. It's uh, it'll carry th- through a lot of time. I feel very buoyant a lot of, a lot of time. I'm a pretty happy guy for the most part. Uh-huh. And um, so anyway, that's I think that that's probably the biggest lesson for me. Walk me through um, like a year in the vineyard, like month by month. You know, like say on your old Zen, uh, you know, starting in. You know, sometime in the winter. Well, uh, January, generally speaking, we don't do anything. Uh, January, I'm not a skier, so I don't even like being around here in January. It's my, <laughs> my most unfavorite month. And most of the time, I've, I've, if I'm here, I've got cabin fever. And I'm, I'm hoping that 
I can spend more time south as I as I get older here. Uh, February we start pruning. And we'll put a we'll put a crew out. Now we have uh, we probably have about 150 acres of pruned, about 15 different vineyards uh, from my my vineyard management company. All right. Um, and we'll we'll start out with about six to eight people, and then we'll crew up to about 12 or 14. So that'll be through February. And it's pretty cold at that time. It's like uh, it's uh, it's it's cold. Early. We don't usually get started to about seventh or eighth. Uh, most of my uh, people that work on my crew, we work for uh, cherry orchards, uh, pruning cherries in December, January, and, and early February like that. And then we usually get going around the eighth or so. It's it's not terribly cold. Not not compared to where I come from, Indiana. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's. Uh, yeah, there's some cold. There's some cold days, but for the most part, you're talking in the upper 30s or in the 40s, and every now and then it'll, it'll go up into the 50s. Yeah. Uh, um, so we go through February, we go through March. March, the wind's blowing, it gets brisk, and we're, you know we're just basically moving through, pruning all these vineyards. And that's March. Uh, in we usually are finished in. in Pretty much finished by the end of March. Uh, in April, we usually uh, dig the nursery. If we've got any plantings that we're going to be doing, uh, we do plantings. Uh, when does the sap start running? Sap usually starts running around the, probably by the middle of March, I uh-huh. think. And I think in the Willamette Valley, people might put more importance on that than I do. Um, and it might also be part of the reason that they put more importance on their soil than I do. Uh, for the for most all the vineyards that I do, especially in the Dalles, not necessarily in Hood River, but especially in the Dalles, we have irrigation. Mm-hmm. And so I think if somebody's looking at sap running, they might feel like that they're wasting water. Uh, like in Olympic Valley, if they're if they're uh, Dry land farming up, uh, but for me, I'm not. I'm not worried about it. You know, I, I don't usually. We don't usually start irrigating until about uh, late May or early June, anyway. But but I'm not real concerned about that. But that's where it starts. Uh-huh. Um, plants start pumping up some. So April, we uh, quite often will dig the uh, um, the nursery and lay out a field and plant it. Uh, we may put trellis in. Uh, quite often, we'll plant, and we just put the plants in and the irrigation in, and we don't put the trellis in until the next year. Uh-huh. So, quite often, uh, those are kind of the two things that we'll do, uh, and that's uh, March and April. We usually don't plant until about the end of April. We might dig the nursery, but we don't plant till about the end of April. Because uh, once you plant, you're probably looking at 10, 10 days or two weeks before uh, they start pushing uh, buds out and leaves. Uh-huh. And uh, I kind of figure by the first or second week of May, we're pretty much we're generally out of uh, out of risk of uh, frost, and, and that's part of the reason I wait till the end of April to plant. Now, again, over in the Lamar Valley, I think they do most planting in the February, February to March. Or even, uh, um, gosh, I photographed some uh, October, November. I, I I have heard of and seen plantings uh, in the fall, and that's not a bad idea. Uh-huh. I, I kind of think fall is, is a pretty good time because uh, because then you got it going and and um, but I've never done that. I've never done that. Yeah. So. But then uh, in the Willamette Valley, they don't worry about, you know, like, I think that you probably have frost later than, than Willamette Valley does, too. Yeah, that's, it's, it's possible, yeah. You know, we certainly have winter freezes that they don't have. Yeah. Uh, if we get a winter freeze, it's going to hit us uh, sometime between the 20th of December and about the 8th of February. Uh-huh. And, and I've seen that, I saw it in 1996 and 1991. In 2003, it came within 80 miles of here, and, it, and, and, and an ice storm that closed the I-84 for a week saved us. Because that ice storm, 
uh, took it, it over it overran the, the 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 frigid air that was coming in from wow. from the, the continental uh, shelf, the uh-huh. continental uh, center of the country. Um, they were they were at 15 below, 80 miles east of here, and we were at four above. Oh. Now in '96, my vision hit 13 below, and over on three miles, 16 below. And in '91, it was the same thing. Wow. Um, and now it freezes. That freezes everything in my vineyard to the ground when, when we get that kind of. Uh, then we start over because yeah. it's own rooted, it's own rooted uh, plants. Yeah. So uh, back to April. Uh, we're generally either doing trellis or uh, uh, we've got some sprays that uh, we start putting on in uh, late March. Sulfur sprays uh, for uh, mites. Uh, and that goes on into early April. There's two of them. And then uh, get our, uh, by the end of April, uh, we're generally working on a project, whether it be planning or trellising, something like that. Uh-huh. Um, we've laid off some people up from the pruning crew, and we're down to probably 10 people now. We were on the pretty crew, we've been running probably around 16 or so. Uh, and then uh, we're getting to May, and May we're, we start spraying, and we're uh, basically we're spraying for mildew. Uh, every spray is pointing to a mildew, and then there's a few things that we put into the sprays to uh, uh, for the plant. Uh, do a zinc and boron, uh, some minerals for the right, right. So uh, some helps for fruit set, some helps for uh, uh, growth. Uh, so through May there's sprays. Uh, we're watching the plants. Uh, we start working on irrigation. Uh, fit, get all the irrigation up and running, and make sure that you know we don't have leaks and and change out. Uh, we have drip irrigation on everything, and we change out our emitters that uh, aren't working right, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then, uh, and then we start running into June. We're getting now we're coming into uh, bloom. We have bloom uh, probably around the eighth or tenth of June. Uh, it, it can it can vary based on the year, but that's. The first, the first thing, there's like four phases for uh, grape growth. The first phase is bud break, mm-hmm. bud, bud swell, bud break. The second is bloom, and now after bloom, uh, now you have uh, the the grapes start sizing. You go from pea size to to actually the cluster close. Again, we're uh, it. Uh, Shortly after bloom, we start picking leaves. We pick leaves off uh, either the east side of the of the uh, vines or the north side of the vines, depending on which way the rows are running. Um, and that's pretty that's pretty full that's pretty full time deal there. Uh, then um, by the time we get to the end of June and into July, we go across. Uh, the Zinfandel and we uh, thin, we'll thin down to one cluster per shoot. Uh, we might do some sheet thinning uh, someplace where we have too many shoots coming out. Uh, and, uh, and and usually by about mid-June, usually by around mid-June we start our irrigation up. Uh, and we run, by the time we get into July and August, the, the real heat of the year, we probably run once a week on a block, we run, uh, oh, we're, we're back down to about eight hour sets now, so we put about uh, eight gallons of plant on for uh, the heat of the year, July and August. Eight gallons over that entire period? Per, no, per week. Per week? Per week. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, we have some, we have a lot. Like the Willamette well, Valley has uh, the their evapotranspiration rate is 0.22 inches per day. Uh-huh. Uh, I take that back. That's not the Willamette Valley. That is Hood River. That's Hood River. Hood River is a lot cooler than us. Hood River has uh, 
between uh, probably between depending on where you're at between 2,200 and 2,500 heat units uh, a year, uh -huh. and the Dow's has about 3,000, about 20, probably 2,700 to 3,000 heat units per year. Yeah. yeah, it's a whole other region in yeah. that respect. Uh, yeah. But anyhow, uh, yeah, we do about uh, 2,800 to an inch a day that we lose. Uh, it's sucked out of the out of the soil just by wind and 90 degree heat yeah. in July and August. Uh, so we do that. Uh, again, we're leaf picking. We're trying to uh, uh, open up uh, clusters to the sun, but we don't want to get them sunburned. Yeah. Uh, we have to. We have to be careful about that. That we don't. We don't. So you're picking on the east side then. Yeah. But but you're going to do it like in the morning, and once it gets up to 80 degrees or 85 degrees, if you open those clusters up. See, oh, you can start. Okay. You can start with your pea size, and they'll kind of tan like people will. Uh huh. But I can't get across everything all, all that fast. Yeah. So as we get to the later stuff that we hadn't got to yet, now you got berries out there. They're not just peas. They're yeah. berries out there. Yeah. And so if you if you pull those leaves off and open them up, and it goes to 95 degrees that day. You got problems. You'll, you, they'll sunburn just collapse feet. and sunburn. Yeah, they'll, uh, and, and, and so wow. we have to be we have to be a little careful with that. We also do uh, hedging. Uh, we, uh, we, we we do our hedging by hand. There's some blocks that we have a little more growth than others, depending on the soil types. Uh, and uh, so we'll do some hedging out there. Um, we do some thinning, more thinning. And uh, so that gets us through, and, and also leaf picking. That gets us through July. There's, we're still spraying. We're still running irrigation. And then we get into August, and August is the next phase, and, and the next phase is verasion, or verazone. And that's when red grapes turn red and, and white grapes turn soft. Um, at that point, we go through almost every block. Well, not almost. Well, okay, almost. Let's say almost. And we thin. And we thin based on... Thin the fruit. Uh, yeah, it's a color thinning. Uh, the last... Depending on how much fruit we think is out there, uh, we may take off the last 10%, 15%, or 20% that turns from green to the color. And, and so basically we're taking off the last stuff to turn and we're also dropping the, the crop levels. Yeah. Um, to and that you're dropping it to a level that you and the winemaker determine, or you know, it's like. Uh, well, for the most part, the, the the winemakers and me, for the most part, have worked together. Uh, and, uh, it's, I think it's pretty much up to me now. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, if so, if a winemaker wants to come out and get involved in the vineyard. Uh, they're welcome to do it. Yeah. Take some of the responsibility off of my shoulders, but uh, most winemakers don't uh, at this point. I've kind of been doing this for a while. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's, it's, it's like, winemaker, like they, you know, like some winemakers like to have, you know, like less fruit, you know, more concentrated fruit. Uh, others, you know, have different kind of attitudes. You know, uh, like how much like fruit per acre. They, they're they're pulling. I mean, gosh, I was reading um, our Domain Serene. They want 1.7 tons per acre. Yeah. And so the vineyard manager, he, you know, and the winemaker are deciding, okay, like, you know, when are we going to be pulling so that we get the 1.7 uh, you know, tons per acre? Well, they may have the... Uh they may have decided that the, that that block, that area, can sustain the. Um, I got blocks all over the Columbia Gorge. Yeah, uh, it's not huge like variety. one place. Yeah, it's variety. not one variety either. Yeah. Um, for the most part. I've been at this long enough. 
if somebody wants to have less crop, if they want to pay me by the acre, that's fine. Yeah. We'll do that. But it kind of depends on whether it's a tonnage contract or an acreage contract. And uh, and I kind of feel like I'll know, I like um, just from experience. I know how far we can take some varieties, and, and some of them we want to cut back on. And, and, it, and you do get more intense flavors with lower crop levels, but it also depends on what variety. And like Merlot, you can hang a bigger crop level and still have those intense flavors because you could have hung an even bigger one and not had them, you know, like around here. You can ripen Merlot off pretty. I've never had a year where it's ever been in question. Uh -huh. um, Whereas Cabernet, that's a different story. There, it's right on the edge. Uh, yeah. You have to be sure to have a low enough crop level there. Um, well, you, get, you get a huge variety out here, don't yeah. you? Yeah. My gosh. Yeah. And um, there's been some uh, winemakers that I've worked with over the years. Uh, and we kind of, and I like to get on the same page with them, but for the most part, I think most of them trust me to bring it in at the level and and, and, and make the call on the picking. It's a long ways from the drive. I think it. I think it, I think it's. I think it's uh, nice for them in some respects to not have to drive out here and deal with this with these vineyards. You know, that might be a sales point. Um, Okay, let's finish out the year then. It's like so. Okay, uh, so we're in. Uh, we're in. Uh, we go into August. We're in Verasion. We uh, we definitely do a uh, color thinning on the Zinfandel. That'll be our second thinning. Uh huh. We do that. We uh -huh. do a second thinning on the Zinfandels. Um. Uh, and uh, and then uh, that's September. We should. If we have any place where we don't feel like we did a very good job of leaf picking and open up some of the, uh, or it might have been that we couldn't pick as many leaves because it was in the heat of the summer, uh, we quite often we go back and we'll do a little more of that in September. And then the other thing that I forgot is um, around the 15th or 20th of August, we start putting bird net up. We bird net every vineyard that I've got, every acre I've got. And we bird net 150 acres. And a lot of people say, isn't that expensive? Well, yeah, it's expensive. The net we buy uh, costs about 800 bucks an acre. And it lasts about 8 to 10 years. So we figure we amortize that 100 bucks an acre a year. It's costing us about... It's costing more than it used to cost. Uh, it, I would say it costs about uh, 350, probably 350, uh, about 300, about 250 dollars to put it up, and about 150 dollars to take it down. So we're looking at about almost 500 dollars an acre now yeah. to put it up and take it down each year. But what it does do is it protects the crop we have, and it allows us to pick it. When we say it's right, when we say it's ready to pick, not when the birds yeah. are putting so much pressure on us that we have to pick it just to get it off because the birds are killing us. Yeah. If we had this all in one place in one block where maybe we could do some things to, you know, to fight the birds yeah. off cannons or whatever, yeah. uh, we might not have to do the net, but it's blocks all over the place. They're almost always surrounded by trees. And, and quite often they're close enough to town that the cannons irritate the neighbors enough that there's yeah. lawsuits being thrown around. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's going on. That starts in August. In September, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to do final things to the vines, uh, final hedging, final leaf picking, if we feel like we've still got too many leaves on some of them. Uh, put the net up. And uh, then we start picking. We start harvest. Uh, we start harvesting about the. Well, this year I think it was around the 14th or 15th of September. And uh, and then we go till uh, 
We go through October, and uh, we stopped at November 2nd this year. Wow. Um, when we get done picking, uh, try to take a weekend off, <laughs> and uh, and then the crews go. Uh, the crew goes into picking up bird net. Um, I'm generally still running uh, some food around, uh, trucking, uh, and then probably the next move for me is to uh, go get all the empty bins that are scattered all over the Lamont Valley and try to get them back to their rightful owners and back. Some of them are mine, some of them are other wineries, some of them are other vineyards, um, and then uh, and then through November. I kind of turned into a packing house because I now I've got to uh, build all the wineries uh, and get money in. Yeah. We pay all the pickers, and uh, then when uh, there's about oh about well just uh, last week actually uh, I laid off about uh, seven or eight guys, and now we've got about an eight-man crew going, and we'll finish out the picking up the bird net. And then uh, we'll move to some other things, uh, getting kind of getting ready for winter. Uh, we uh, drain irrigation lines, uh, make sure all the equipment's uh, ready for winter. Uh, go to projects around the, around the farm that we've kind of been putting off, and you know work at some of that stuff. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm I'm trying to uh, uh, build, get the buildings out to the wineries, and then uh, when I get done with that, then I build the spreadsheets for the property owners, so I can write the checks to the property owners for the for the grapes that I sell uh -huh. for. Yeah. So then that happens pretty much through November. We try to get those checks out by the end of November, and then. Uh, when I meet with my uh, accountant uh, first of December, we'll see if I made any money. <laughs> and whether we made any money selling grapes or selling wine, there's two companies, so uh -huh. we got two sets of books. Yeah. And try to see how how those how those did. And yeah. If we made some money. We might want to buy some equipment before next year, <laughs> 20 years out. That's right, yeah. Get rid of that money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and now we're at the end of the summer, we'll go yeah. back to January again. Yeah, and then you hibernate. Yeah. Lonnie, I really appreciate your time.